Shalom. This is Reverend John Ferret, and I want to welcome you to Truth Nuggets, number 13. This is the seventh lesson on the Lord's Prayer, and I have entitled this one, Our Daily Bread. So again, we consider Jesus teaching his disciples this prayer 2,000 years ago. He's teaching this to devout religious Jewish men, his disciples, his Talmudim in Hebrew. It's a distinctly Jewish culture and so totally different from ours. So we put the text back into its historical context. And again, we ask those questions. What did those first disciples hear? What did they understand? What did they see? What did it mean for them? What was God's original message? Because they were the first ones to hear it, not us. And as we recapture their understanding, the meaning for us in the 21st century as Christians is enriched and expanded. For us, the Lord's Prayer becomes an aspect of our focus to be real-time disciples of Jesus. We talked about this in earlier lessons. In Luke, the version of the Lord's Prayer in Luke, all begins as a result of a disciple who sees Jesus praying and comes to the rabbi and says, Jesus teaches to pray. A disciple would want that to happen because a disciple in Jesus' day wants to be what their rabbi is. They want to pray like him. They want to teach like him. They want to go in his name. And so we're beginning to see that the Lord's Prayer becomes that part of our lives where we are focusing on wanting to be a true disciple of Jesus. To be like Jesus daily. To live daily. So that we are the imitation of Christ. The church has coined that phrase. Where do you think it comes from? It comes from the idea of a rabbi and a disciple in Jesus' day. Now for me, Hatafila Adonai, the Lord's Prayer. I have renamed it Hatafila Talmudim, the prayer of the disciples, because he gave it to us. Now, this is how I start my day. This is how I begin my prayer sessions. Indeed, for me. And then I say the Shema. And both of these are a restatement every day, day by day, continually. To let the Lord know I want to grow more into what a true disciple is. So, how may have those first Talmudim, disciples of Jesus, understood the phrase, because this is where we're at right now, and I'm reading it from Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, from the New American Standard Version. How might those first disciples understood the phrase, give us this day our daily bread? Now, what I need to do is I need to go into the Greek. It's important to do that because if we leave it in English, and even if we leave it in Greek, without putting it back into its Hebrew framework, its historical context, we see that there's perhaps a dilemma. So in Matthew 6, 11, as I just read, give us this day our daily bread. However, when we go to Luke and we read in chapter 11, verse 3, give us each day our daily bread. Wait a minute, we've got two different versions in here. Now, if we go back to Matthew 6, 11, it talks about this day. The Greek word there is semeron, and the Strong's number, for your information, is G4594. And when you go to Thayer's Greek lexicon, please do not use Strong's concordance to try to find the meaning of a word uh, that does not work with Greek, does not work with Hebrew, because Greek words 
themselves are almost conceptual in meaning, not definitional. And in other words, they're used in a variety of different ways across the scripture. Same thing with Hebrew, and that is definitely a conceptual language. So we have this Greek word, samaron, and our translators have translated it this day. There's no problem with that. Uh, Thayer's Greek lexicon would say, in essence, it means now. So you might say, Lord, now please give us our bread. But when we go to Luke 11, chapter 11, verse 3, we have this concept of give us each day our daily bread. Now there, the Greek for each day, because it's not this day, it's each day, is two Greek words. The first one is kata, G2516. And the second word that goes with it, G2250, is hemera. So when you take these two words, kata hemera, it means day by day. Or you would say each day. You'd say, wait a minute here, we've got two things going on here. Who's right? In Matthew, the words imply now, at this time, today. However, Luke, when he talks about each day or day by day, today, tomorrow, and the next day, it seems that the focus is much more than on now, uh, much more than on today at this moment. It seems as if it's for the future. So we have two different ideas in here. One is praying in Matthew for the bread today, and Luke seems to be saying that, no, what Jesus meant is to pray for your bread every day. Now, in order to resolve this conflict in the Greek, we need to go to the Hebrew culture. Dr. Brad Young, I have mentioned him before in previous sessions, has a fantastic article at JerusalemPerspective.com. I cannot give you the article because it's copyrighted. In previous lessons, I have linked you to that article. I will link you to the article again in this session, in the session description. And again, remember, at JerusalemPerspective.com, it costs 60 bucks a year to join. And like I said, if you're a serious student of the Bible, this is an, an amazing scholarly resource. Uh, and you're, it's going to be worthwhile uh, for you to spend the money to actually have scholarly resources to understand, uh, again, Jesus in his Hebrew uh, perspective. At any rate, in his article, he's talking about this dilemma, and he says we need to go to the Hebrew culture, we need to go to Jesus' day and how the Jews understand many of these concepts. So, for instance, he references the Babylonian Talmud, which is a, I don't know, it's probably, if you had a printed copy, it's probably 15, 20, 25 volumes of commentary just on the Torah. Finished again, probably 500 uh, AD, uh, and it is rabbinical commentary on the Torah, uh, even going from Jesus' day. So in there, it talks about Hillel, a great rabbi, uh, one of the great rabbis, him, him and Shammai, uh, that were the pair. They were called the pair. And uh, it, it talks about Hillel. And it, the quote is, all his actions were for the sake of heaven. In other words, all his actions were for the sake of, like we talked about, God. Not for heaven, but for God, for Adonai. As it is said, blessed be the Lord day by day. Now, this is interesting because in the Talmud, they're talking about day by day. They go on to emphasis, emphasize that in this approach, he'll emphasize the today of his existence by the phrase, blessed be the Lord day by day. His focus was on the, for the uh, living for the sake of God, for the sake of the Lord day by day. And his emphasis was today. That's very interesting. So again, what we have 
is this view in Jesus's culture, even before Jesus started his ministry by Hillel, that the focus is on today, not tomorrow. So that's in Beitza 16a. In another place in the Talmud that Dr. Brad Young uh, shows us, in Sota 48b, he talks about Rabbi Eliezer. And Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, his quote is, anyone who has a piece of bread in his basket today and says, what will I eat tomorrow, belongs to those of little faith. So here's another aspect of the Jewish culture. Now this is perhaps, oh, in the year, oh, I'm guessing 90, maybe 100, maybe 110 A.D., but still it's part of the culture. It's close to Jesus' day. And again, what, what's the focus? The focus is on today. The focus is not on tomorrow. So it seems as if when we talk about the emphasis on today and don't focus on tomorrow, the concept of day by day has the implication of continually. So blessed be the Lord day by day in Psalm 68, 19 gives the idea, yeah, bless the Lord today and continually. It's a different uh, use or meaning of the phrase day by day. Jesus, likewise, focused on today. Why are we surprised? This is part of his culture, and when he's teaching, he's emphasizing this concept of today. So quoting Brad Young's article, Jesus likewise focused on today. The promise that God will provide for a disciple's physical needs must be viewed in the context of Jesus' exhortation to put God king, God's kingdom above all else. And this phrase in Matthew 6, 33 through 34. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be yours as well. Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Today has enough trouble of its own. So again, what we're seeing is God, Jesus is saying, seek the kingdom, seek it day by day, do this continually. And it so fits the culture of Jesus' day. Don't focus and don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the day after tomorrow. Just consider today and trust in God for the rest of it. I'm proposing a question. I'm wondering if these ideas of this focus on today really comes from the lessons of Exodus. Exodus, the Passover, this is so huge in the mind of religious Jewish people, especially in Jesus' day and even today. The Exodus and all the events of the Exodus are so deeply ingrained, especially in the disciples' worldview, their religious worldview, and also from among many religious Jews in that day. So these ideas of the focus on today... Again, is it possible that it comes from that lesson? Because if you remember, God gave his people bread from heaven. Moses said, hey, God's going to give you bread from heaven. And they saw it come down, and the people said, hey, what is it? Hebrew for what is it is mana. So that's where we come with the idea that it's called mana. Now, God said, you'll just get enough for today, and only for today. And I'll keep on doing this, so trust God for tomorrow. In other words, get what you got today, and day by day, continually, you will see God taking care of you. So trust in God for the rest. I think this comes back to something in the book of Lamentations by written by Jeremiah. And again, this concept of the hope in today. I'm reading in Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 22. And Jeremiah writes, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning, Great 
is your faithfulness. I love that because what Jeremiah is saying, God's loving kindness goes on day by day, continually. And we can look at it new each morning. We have this concept of today, and we have this concept of the future as well. So our hope, God is the same now and then in Exodus, and he's the same forever, so we trust him today. So it seems as if that uh, it's possible that these ideas come from the Exodus and the lessons of the Exodus. And this would only make sense because the Torah means instruction, does not mean law. And the Torah is God's instruction for his people to understand how to live day by day as righteous before him. Now, when we go to uh, Proverbs 30, 7 through 8, it could very well be that Jesus is also referring to this scripture only for the simple reason it has this implication again of trusting in God for our allotted portion. So when we go to Proverbs 30 verses 7 through 8 we read, two things I asked of you, do not refuse me before I die. So in other words these are two things we're asking of God. This is the you in this proverb. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion. Now actually in Hebrew, it says feed me with the bread that is my portion. However, the word lechem can also be used for food in general. So in this verse... When it talks about my portion, the Hebrew word there is chuchi, and again the Strong's number is H2706, and it comes from the root that gives a picture of cutting. And so, in other words, my portion is one's cut, one's portion cut from the whole, or an appointed portion. So when we go to Matthew 6.11 and we talk about our daily bread, we might rephrase it by saying, Today, Lord, may you give us our bread, our allotted portion, our cut that belongs to us. Give us what you know we need. Now, I added that phrase, give us what you know we need, because Jesus starts out the Lord's Prayer with a key verse. It's Matthew 6, 8. And it says, Jesus is saying, and when you pray, you better realize that your Father already knows what you need even before you ask. So the impression here with that phrase and along with this, God already knows what our allotted portion is. Now, there's a prayer that Jewish people do today, many Jewish religious people do today, with regards to a prayer that's related to the meal. And it's called Grace After Meals. Now, I want to talk about that prayer, but let me go off on a side here to talk about this idea of grace before meals or grace after meals. Now, in Jesus' culture and in Jewish culture today, before the meal started, you might bless God for bread, for wine, for vegetables, for the good lamb that's on the table or whatever. But the Jewish people, after the meal is over, that, that's when they thank him. So in other words, before the meal, they may bless him and bless God for specific pieces of food, but it's after the meal that they thank him. The reason being is, God commanded it. God commanded grace after meals. I'm going to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 10. And God is saying to Israel, through Moses, 
when you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God. And remember, Lord your God really is Yahweh Elohim. So Lord there is all capitalized. That means that's God's name. And God is Elohim just in general. So you shall bless Yahweh Elohim. So Yahweh is your God. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. So religious Jews say grace after meals since God commanded it. He never commanded to do grace before meals. Now we in the church practice that and it is a mistaken notion that comes from not understanding the Jewish culture. And I can see how. If you're cut away from, if you're really cut off from that culture and you don't understand the practices uh, and the rituals of Jesus' day, you read the New Testament and every time that Jesus is related, somehow related to a meal, feeding the 4,000 or the 5,000, remember he blessed God. He blessed God for the bread, he blessed God for the fish, and he fed the 4,000 and 5,000. But what we're not seeing is. It was just a common practice that the Jewish people, religious Jewish people, would pray after the meal because it's a commandment by God to thank him for the meal, thank him for everything that they have received. Now, once I learned this, uh, and I knew I wanted to do what Jesus did, uh, I wanted to be a disciple, I wanted to pray like Jesus, to live like him, I started adding the prayer after eating. And I actually use that Jewish prayer that I mentioned that the Jewish people use today. Jesus may have actually even said this. It's in the Jewish Siddur, the Jewish prayer book. But coming back to the original thesis that we're talking about, it really demonstrates, indeed, that the Jewish people believe that God gives us the food for today in our allotted portion. He's got that awareness. Let me read the prayer to you. There's No, there's a lot more to this. This is not the only prayer that they say. This is the first blessing of many blessings after the meal. And here's the prayer. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who nourishes the entire world in his goodness, with grace, with kindness, and with mercy. He gives nourishment to all flesh, for his kindness is eternal. And through his great goodness we have never lacked, and may we never lack, nourishment for all eternity. For the sake of his great name, because he is God who nourishes and sustains all and benefits all, and he prepares food for all, for his creatures which he has created. As it is said, you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Blessed are you, Adonai, who nourishes all. Now in the Siddur there's some rabbinical commentary related to this prayer and it says this nourishes sustains benefits nourishes refers to food now that's their opinion the bible doesn't say that or the prayer doesn't say that but the rabbis are saying from our view nourishes refers to food sustains refers to clothing does good refers to shelter but here's the key sentence in conjunction, the three phrases enumerate the basic needs of life, all of which are provided by God. So over and over and over again, in the Jewish culture, we see that God already knows what we need. From Proverbs 30, verse 8, we are asking God to give us our cut, our allotment, and since God already knows what we need, God must be determining this allotment. So when we come to the two different versions of Matthew and Luke, and we say, who's right? Matthew's writing, give us this day our daily bread. And Luke is writing, give us each day our daily bread. And just as an aside, the phrase in Hebrew, which would be translated day by day, is two Hebrew words. So in other words, if you said, bless God, uh, 
bless Yahweh, our God, day by day, you would say, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Yom Yom. Now the word Yom is day. But when you use Yom Yom together, it basically means day by day. And in Gesenius, Hebrew lexicon, Yom Yom, has the implication of continually. So when we reconnect it to our Jewish to the Jewish culture, for those first disciples, when they heard Matthew's words, or if they heard Luke's words in terms of the writing, they, they agreed with both. Because yes, it made sense to them. And to say that the Father, that we rely on him to give us our daily portion. It made sense to him to thank him for today and to trust him continually, to trust him yom yom, to trust him day by day, and not to worry about tomorrow. So Luke is right. It made sense to them to trust in God for our everyday needs. And for us, this is from Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. You know it. For, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, and not a result of works that anyone should boast. For we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. In other words, we are God's workmanship, and we belong to Jesus. We're in his name. For good works that he's prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now we remember Psalm 23, verse 1, and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That Hebrew word there for want has the meaning of being diminished, of being put down, of being without, of getting to a place as a sheep and all of a sudden realizing, wait a minute, I got here and I've, I've got nothing. I've got nothing to keep going. So yes, for us, we pray, Hatafila Adonai, the Lord's Prayer. We pray Hatafila Talmudim, we rename it because Jesus' prayer, he gives to us. It's the prayer of the disciples. And our Rabbi Jesus gave it to us to be like him. Because the Greek words for good works in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, also has the implication of a career, a job. It has the implications of a profession, an endeavor, an occupation. If you're a disciple, it's not just good works. We're given an occupation. We now want to be like Jesus every day of our lives as we go in his name. So yes, Jesus, we want to be your true disciples. This is our occupation. You've prepared us for this. And we know you as our good shepherd. And we know that you will not allow us to be diminished. When we get to that place where all of a sudden in our role of discipleship, or in our role as disciples, that we have things that we must specifically do, that we're called to at that point, we will have everything we need. You will give us our portion, our cut as your sheep. You will give us our portion, our allotment, as your Talmudim, your disciples, to live and serve you today, trusting Trusting in you that you'll be the same day by day, yom yom, tomorrow and forever. This seems to be reflected in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verses 5 through 8. And I'd like to end our lesson by reading these verses. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. 
For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their contact, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Today he feeds us and we continually trust in him. Shalom.